Donc, je disais merci de nous avoir rejoints pour ce quatrième épisode de notre séminaire. Donc, nous aurons deux interventions, comme les fois passées. Une première intervention par Gunel Ekrot, qui nous vient de Uppsala, en Suède, et une deuxième par Stefano Caneva, qui est pour le moment en, en post-doc à l'Université de Liège. Alors, c'est Gunel Ekrot qui va ouvrir euh, ce séminaire aujourd'hui et donc je vais vous la présenter brièvement pour ceux qui ne la connaissent pas encore. Euh, je dirais pour commencer que j'ai rencontré Gnell pour la première fois en 1999. C'était un colloque à Valladolid en Espagne et le colloque en question s'intitulait « Héros et héroïnes dans les mythes et les cultes grecs ». Et vous voyez qu'on n'est pas très loin du, de la thématique d'aujourd'hui. Et la raison en est que Gunel Ekrot, à l'époque, euh, avait juste terminé une thèse de doctorat sur les rituels sacrificiels pour les héros euh, en Grèce ancienne. Et en l'invitant à nous rejoindre aujourd'hui pour nous parler des héros, je l'ai en quelque sorte placé dans une machine à remonter le temps, hein, puisqu'elle a retrouvé ainsi euh, la thématique des héros qu'elle n'a jamais tout à fait quitté depuis le temps de sa thèse, mais néanmoins, pendant toutes ces années, elle a surtout centré ses intérêts sur la, le deuxième aspect qui apparaissait dans le titre de sa thèse, à savoir le sacrifice. En effet, de formation, Gunel Ekrot est archéologue, mais avec une, très, une excellente maîtrise de tout, tout les, tous les types de documentation en sciences de l'Antiquité, mais ce, ce goût pour l'archéologie, la conduite, à se spécialiser toujours davantage en zooarchéologie, donc cette préoccupation lors des fouilles, cette préoccupation particulière pour les ossements d'animaux. Il faut bien dire que pendant des décennies, on s'est extrêmement peu soucié à la fois des tessons de céramique et des ossements d'animaux. Les choses ont grandement changé depuis, euh, depuis un certain temps maintenant. Et c'est dans cette voie-là que Gunel Ekrot a déployé une partie de son activité avec cet intérêt particulier pour l'apport de l'étude des ossements dans notre compréhension plus fine de l'opération sacrificielle. Et donc, elle a publié une grande quantité d'articles sur la question notamment de la répartition de la viande sacrificielle, sur la, le, le découpage de l'animal. Donc, toutes des préoccupations qui nous semblent extrêmement concrètes, mais qui sont fondamentales si on veut comprendre de façon un peu fine comment se passait un sacrifice euh, grec. Or, le sacrifice étant au cœur de la pratique, c'est évidemment, ce sont des informations euh, fondamentales. Et donc, comme je le disais euh, en commençant, maintenant, Gunel est professeure à l'université d'Uppsala, mais elle a, pendant plusieurs années, vécu ici à Paris, et euh, une bonne partie de la recherche sur euh, le sacrifice a été menée euh, dans, dans cette ville. Donc, cette occasion, c'est à la fois un retour au héros, si je puis dire, et un retour à Paris. Et donc, ma chère Gunel, je te laisse la parole. <rire> Wait until I've been speaking. <laughs> well, um, can you hear me, everybody? Well, thank you very much, Vincent, for inviting me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back in Paris. It's always a great pleasure every time I come back. And I also have to clarify that when I met Vincent the first time in Valladolid all those years ago, we introduced, we said what we, our names. You asked me the topic of my thesis. And then your next question is, where are you going to publishing this? publish this? I have a series. Karenos. <laughs> so, but thank you for that. <clears throat> well, ancient Greek heroes form a particular category of supernatural beings between gods and departed humans. On a general level, it's easy to keep them apart, but a closer inspection shows that the category of the hero is often blending over to those of gods and ordinary dead persons in a manner that makes too tight definitions uncomfortable or even incomprehensible to the modern eye. This presentation will explore, explore the hero concept and how we are to define what a hero is, both based on the ancient evidence and modern scholarly approaches. Of particular interest is the body of the hero as a living entity, but also in the form of his or her bones after death. Moreover, there is the intriguing feature of heroes that they had a second life after death, and sometimes a life that was more important and more powerful than their first existence. 
even if a clear-cut definition of a hero, what a hero is, and why a hero is that, cannot be arrived at, the mapping of this very heterogeneous character of heroes is an important part of understanding, uh, understanding this category of beings within the wider field of Greek religion and figures receiving religious intention. In a classic statement about ancient Greek heroes uh, by Nicholas Coldstream in 1976, he said the following, Greek hero worship has always been a rather untidy subject where any general statement is apt to provoke suspicion. And as someone who's been working on hero cults back and forth for like 20 years, I really, I can only agree. But we also have to recognize that what might seem untidy or even incomprehensible to us today may have been perfectly consistent to the ancient Greeks. To a degree, the problem of understanding lies with us and um, us, the modern viewers, who fail to grasp the intricacies of ancient Greek religion. And when that is the case, we tend to speak of inconsistencies, even though part of the problem may simply be that we just don't understand. This being said, the presentation will focus on precise this untidiness, as this is also one of the most interesting aspects of Greek heroes. To begin with, heroes are dead, but they are not regular mortals. They're also divine beings, but they're not gods. Most interestingly, as I said, they have two lives, one before they die and one after. Usually, the second life meant an existence more powerful and important than the first one, and it is in their second life that they become the focus of religious attention. To complicate matters further, after death, a hero could also exert his power uh, through his bones, as well as appearing and actively engaging with the lives of the living. I will try to explore this complexity in, from various angles. How did heroes interact with mortals in the surroundings after they had taken on this second heroic life? What was the role of the bones in all of this? Are there cases of heroes who both had recognized and venerated bones and who appeared in physical form, that is, a kind of dual power manifestation? Some basic observations of uh, <clears throat> how a person at all became a hero might be a good start. A general trait of heroes is that they had lived and died and then received some kind of veneration after death. Some heroes were mythical figures worshipped after they had died, well-known ones like Achilles, Menelaus and Theseus, but also less famous characters like the child of Feltes, eaten alive by a snake and then worshipped as Archimoros at Nemea after his demise. Other heroes had lived as ordinary mortals, who were elevated to a different and more powerful status after dying, since they had done specific deeds, such as being founders of cities, great athletes, artists, or died for their country in battle, but also because they had done something very, very extreme, and this extremeness is an important character of, of heroes. In the latter case, death can be seen as resulting in an upgrade, and the person would now have different powers than before, while he or she was still alive. For mythical heroes, in a sense, the situation is not the same, since some of them are very powerful while still alive, like Heracles or Achilles. In addition, there are also a large number of heroes of which we know next to nothing, apart from the fact that they were worshipped, and we don't, might not even know their names. Heroes are part of a spectrum of non-mortal beings uh, receiving cult in ancient Greeks, uh, where each category blends over to the next one, gods, heroes, and the ordinary dead. When Plato outlines the different categories of recipients of religious attention, he, precise, he presents this kind of division. First the gods, who are worshipped with temples and sacrifices, then the daimonists, then the heroes, and finally the dead, who are to be buried and given appropriate services to keep them happy. The relation between heroes and gods on the one hand and heroes and the ordinary dead on the other needs some further thought. It is obvious that the Greeks saw gods and heroes as distinct entities, but there are numerous ancient sources that speaks of the, god and, the gods and the heroes 
being addressed or worshipped jointly, forming a distinct pair. The fragmentary laws of Draco stipulate that the gods and heroes are to be honoured annually in public with prayer and offerings of fruit and cakes. In various decrees, for example, one from the Deme of Kulitos, um, worship is prescribed to gods and heroes together, while many of the questions proposed to the oracle at Dodona explicitly asks uh, to which gods and heroes the oracle seeker is to sacrifice in order to fare well and prosper. When turning to the divine world for help, addressing the gods and the heroes evidently encompassed the entire field of potential recipients. Demosthenes describe, describes the Athenians as praying and sacrificing to the gods and heroes who guard their city and country, while Xenophon says that Kyros performed sacrifice to all, Greek, to all gods and heroes of Assyria after crossing the border into this country. And there are several more examples to bring up. However, since the Greeks would address two entities, gods and heroes, there was also a distinction. The obvious one is that the gods are immortal and heroes have died. That is, they are of different origins and character. Another one is that gods are not fixed to a particular location, while heroes, in most cases, are locally confined, due to them having a burial at a particular spot or being linked to a local tradition. Although that is not always the case. Here you have the untidiness coming up. In this sense, gods and heroes cater to diverse needs among the worshippers. Within the wider perspective of the polytheistic landscape, various kinds of divine beings were not strange or surprising. And further down the line, after the heroes, so to speak, we have nymphs, river gods, and an array of more than human beings who might not directly be worshipped, but still were more than ordinary mortal men. In practice, matters are perhaps not as clear cut as the gods and heroes pairing suggests. The terminology for gods and heroes, theoi and heroes, is used in a way that the modern viewer tends to find inconsistent. Some heroes are explicitly called theoi, gods, and the same inscription may even contain both terms for the same being. Heroes of Panhellenic Greece, such as Heracles, Asclepius, and Dioscoroi, are often more often called theoi than heroes known from a more localized habitat. Pindar, in his third Nemean ode, in a famous passage, even describes Heracles as a heros theos, a hero god or a god hero. Or this may be a particular case, reflecting the fact that Heracles had died, but then ascended to the Olympus to share the life of the immortal gods. He really made a class journey, one could say. Another interesting case is the hero Giatros, an Athenian local healing hero, who is called Theos in an inscription listing the contents of his sanctuary. And it's been suggested that this denomination, in this denomination, Heroes Yatros, heroes have become part of his proper name. It's like his surname, rather than a specification of his divine status. To illustrate this situation, it's useful to compare the epigraphic accounts of two Attic cult associations, Orgionas, that of Egretes and that of Hippodectes. Both are known from the leases of their properties, inscriptions dating to the fourth century BC. But we have no further information of these two figures in part from these two epigraphic documents. And we know nothing of their mythic history, nor of the location of their cult places. As you can see here, both Egretes and Hippodectes had their own fairly substantial cult place, it seems. There are also trees in the Agretus one, which must have consisted of a piece of land where the Orgeones would gather once a year to perform a sacrifice, particular buildings for the cult, but also installations for dining, and at least in the case of Agretus, a kitchen, a optanion for food preparation. Interestingly, Agretus is called a hero, while Hippodectus is called a theos a god. It's possible that the members of each cult association could decide for themselves what they wanted to call the focus of their cult. And after all, Greek religion had no dogma or central authority that would settle a matter like this, nor would there have been an interest in regulation. 
So why was there a distinction in terminology? Their denominations cannot be explained by the sacrifices they received on each occasion, since they were of the same kind, to see a sacrifice, that is an animal sacrifice where you would eat the meat. And nor of the size of their sanctuaries, their actual precincts and the architectural installations. Perhaps the Orgeones of Hippodectes were a more prominent group than those of Agretes, and therefore they la labeled Hippodectes a god. More importantly, Hippodectus had a statue in his Hieron, which was to be unveiled and oiled. Presumably this is a smaller bronze statue that was like taken care of in connection with this festival. Statues for heroes as focus for their cult seems to have been quite rare. They are mainly evidenced from major well-known hero cults, which also had sanctuaries that were extensive, um, often with a proper mm -hmm. temple. One case is the Amphira Araos of Oropos, whose acrolithic statue must have been huge. And here to the lower right, you see the elbow of the statue. It's like almost a meter long. The el marble elbow of this statue still lying around inside his temple. Also Helen at Terapna, the Menelion at Sparta had a statue. The Heros Ptoios at the Ptoion in Boeotia. And there are also a few other examples. One factor contributing to which denomination the worshippers would have used might therefore have been the magnitude of the cult and its physical installations in the form of a statue or the lack of statue image and perhaps also the fact if there was more of a proper temple building, but that is less, less certain. There was definitely distinction in status between heroes and gods and gods um, and, go gods and heroes and gods are, after all, mentioned first when the two of them are addressed jointly. Gods were apparently perceived as more powerful and wide-reaching. In the late classical period, such distinctions in status are, in the fact, more elaborated on. In Hipparides' funeral speech, which concerns conditions in Athens after 323 BC, um, the, the orator comments that cults um, had been instituted to both Alexander and his friend Hephaestion. Hipparides goes on to complain that the Athenians now had to worship ordinary men with Tusia sacrifices, statues, altars, and temples, and hereby referring to Alexander. While he continues, they also had to honor their servants and heroes. Alexander is a god, Hephaestion, his friend, is a hero thereby indicating his lower status vis-a-vis -vis Alexander. Similarly, Demetrius Polyorchetes was to be treated as a god, while his companions were mere heroes. These examples concern an application of the relation God's heroes to the contemporary political situation, rather than being some kind of theological speculations. We are here moving into a period when the hero concept underwent changes but such a distinction in status between gods and heroes when applied to mortal men would only have been intelligible if the differences had been in, already in existence and also been well established and well understood. And finally, as I argued in my study on hero cult sacrificial rituals in 2002, the sacrifices performed do not seem to have had any relation to the denomination of a recipient as a god or as a hero. If we now turn to the other side of the spectrum, the distinction between gods and the ordinary dead, this is more tricky to pin down. The main difference seems to lie in the fact that heroes receive cultic attention, which is more extensive than that of the immediate family and also expressed different, differently than you would do with your ordinary mortals. Animal sacrifice, for example, was a standard part of Greek hero cult but not of the cult of the dead in the historical period. A hero was a communal concern, an ordinary departed was not. However, the fluidity between these categories is greater than what is often realized and also linked to the kind of evidence we look at. The dead were to be buried and attended to on particular occasions and the tombs taken care of, but so were also the tombs of the heroes. If we look at the archeological record, the situation becomes even more complex. 
In the early Iron Age, some extraordinary burials seem to surpass that of a family's attention to their own dead. The men and women interred at the West Gate at Eretria in the early 6th, 7th century BC, or the couple buried in the huge upsidal building at Tumba Lefkandi, dating to the late 11th or early 10th century, seem to have been characters transgressing the possession, a position of the ordinary dead, judging from the investment in their burials. They may have been regarded as heroes, at least in the Eritrean case, where a triangular marker, and you can see it, um, this one here, you see a plan where you see the actual burials indicated. <clears throat> a triangular marker was constructed on top of the, the cremation burials. It was followed by a small naiskos and a dining hall in several sequences, as well as several botroi, one which was filled with pottery and a range of sheep's heads. Ritual activity in the area continued well into the classical period. One of the male cremations, the one in the center of the triangular structure, included a worn Mycenaean spearhead of bronze, recalling the scepter of Agamemnon, which marked his status as the leader of the Achaeans, and perhaps singling out this individual as the hero par excellence within the burial group. In the case of Lefkandi, uh, the male burial, the male person was cremated and then interned in a bronze urn, an heirloom, heirloom from Cyprus, next to another burial shaft, next to the, uh, the extension of the burial shaft, where we have an inhumed woman with gold jewelry, as well as a next burial shaft with two horses. After the burials were made inside this huge upsidal structure, the building was torn down. The whole structure was covered with a huge mound of earth. And in spite of this spectacular burial, it's interesting to note that there is no evidence of recurrent cult on this site, contrary to Eretria. But instead, the mound contracted burials in front and around it for several generations. And this is, it's from these burials in, here in front that the famous centaur, uh, centaur clay figurine comes, the first depiction of a centaur in, in Greek art. All heroes were dead, but not all departed became heroes. This is absolutely clear. In the archaic and classical period, heroization of the dead was often sanctioned by Delphi. We are in the dark as to the procedure of the early Iron Age, and we don't know how these people, the figures were called and perceived at that date. All the setting of these burials, and there are also more examples here, of course, suggest a communal effort and decision corresponding to that of a hero cult. In the Hellenistic period, on the other hand, some of the ordinary dead also clearly became more than ordinary dead. They could be labeled heroes in inscriptions, and their tombs were of a kind that far supersedes that required for the worship of a departed family member in the ordinary sense, just as the early iron examples you've just seen here. To create a hero in this period, now seems to become more of a communal or even family decision. If someone wanted a family member to become a hero or to be recognized as a hero, this was a private decision to take. Of importance was rather to have the sufficient economic means to create a cult foundation extensive enough to have a communal impact. This would entail large-scale sacrifices and dining for a substantial part of the community but also an impressive tomb structure and perhaps also other architectural installations. But I will leave this topic to Stefano to offer you a complete exploration of, what the, of, of its complexity and what such heroizations could have entailed both in practice and religion. After these remarks on the relation of heroes in, in relation to gods and the ordinary dead, I will focus on one particular aspect of heroes and their cult. And this, that is their body, and especially their bones. Gods, of course, also had bodies. And I'm sure, I, I, I'm sure you're all familiar with Jean-Pierre Venant's seminal text, Le Corps Divin. And presumably, gods also had bones. But since they were immortal, these bones were of little interest, as they would never be visible. The body of a god was exceptional as to beauty, size, luminance, and fragrance. 
the body of the hero would have had these qualifications as well, but their life story was different as they lived and died, a process which would result in actual bare bones, as the case is with all bodies of mortal beings. These bones are of central importance for the cult, but perhaps not as central as scholars have thought. But before we delve into the bones fully, let us consider heroes who were actually reported as seen in Fleisch or some other way after they had died and as interacting with humans by some other means. Divinities could show themselves to humans in different ways and for different reasons. In a recent study on divine epi epiphanies, Giorgia Petrido has defined a range of ways a deity could make himself known to mortals in an anthropomorphic appearance that is looking like a human, as an enacted epiphany, for example, the priest dresses up like the god, by their image, cult statues, as a phasma or spectral appearance, like more of a powerful being or almost a sentiment, through a symbol, object, or even part of the divine body, like a pars pro toto, and finally, by a somorphic or amorphous appearance, even like, like a sound or a smell in which form the deity would appear depended on the occasion and on the location for the appearance. Keeping this in mind, it's interesting that a number of recorded apparitions of heroes is not very large, in particular if compared to the instances when gods are said to have manifested themselves to ordinary mortals. Most cases of epiphanies of heroes seem to have happened in situations of crisis, especially war, the sighting of these heroes is often described as apparitions, phasmata. Two famous cases are reported by Pusanias in, according, in uh, connection with the um, Battle of Marathon, and evidenced from his description of the wall paintings in the Stoa Poikile at Athens. Present on the battlefield, according to his description of this wall painting, were Athena and Heracles, but also Theseus and the local hero Marathon. It's not clear if they were shown as actually participating in the battle. But another figure was also present, the hero Echetlaios or Echetlos, who was dressed like a farmer, but who was fighting actively using a plow as a weapon. The later figure is very obscure and only known from this particular context, from this painting, <clears throat> from this, or this particular setting. But his appearance led the Athenians to institute a cult in his honor after the battle. Similarly, when Delphi was threatened by the Gallic invasion in 279 BC, it was repelled by a forceful actions of a group of heroes, Hyperochos, Laodochos, Pyros, and Phylakos. And also at the Battle of Salamis, heroes were seen helping the Greek ships by stretching out their hands while Helen and the Dioscuri fought with the Spartans against the Messenians. In Philostratos Heroikos, the wine dresser tells the visiting Phoenician of the multiple appearances of Protesilaos, as well as other heroes of the Trojan War. Protesilaos is depicted as a particular case, as the hero first died at Troy, then was resurrected, and finally died again but was now appearing to help the wine dresser in his work in the vineyard. Many of these heroes at Troy would appear regularly, the wine dresser explains, on the plain, they are seen as tall and godlike, and sightings of them give both good and bad omens or portents to the shepherds and cowherds who graze their animals around in this area. The shepherds clearly interact very intimately or very directly with these heroes and they, for example, avoid the tomb of Ayas, considering what Ayas did of the flock, to the flocks of animals of the Greek army during the, the Trojan War, as this could be bad for their own armies. And on one occasion, these shepherds are also said to have gathered around his tomb and insulting the hero so much that he would call out to, to tell them to just to get lost almost. And he also shaked his, he shook his armor to scare them. A young girl has an affair with the Eidolon of Atilochos, while the, the, the Phasma of Patroclos interferes in a game of dice where the players get so upset that they are about to kill each other. The Heroikos also provides an example of a hero making his presence known through an image. 
The statue of Hector at Troy is described as very appealing and godlike, and also to perform good deeds, and even getting so involved in this good deed performing process that the image start to sweat profusely. But Hector also appeared at Troy as a, as a tall man dressed in armor, and on one occasion even killed a young man who insulted him. There are also epiphanies or manifestations with a less positive flavor. Of course, the last guy was killed, so that wasn't positive either. But uh, In Aristophanes' birds, the meeting, a meeting of the, with the hero Orestes is night, at night is said to be best avoided because it would result in you being beat up by the hero. And another negative manifestation of a hero is mentioned by Pausanias, who describes a ghost, an Eidolon, that is ravaging the region of Orchomenos with a rock until the oracle Delphi makes clear to the inhabitants that they were to recover the remains of Actaeon and bury them, and so get rid of the problem. It's interesting that many of these appearances actually lead to the institution of a cult, though for different reasons and with different purposes. The plowman, Echetlaios, received a cult in order to thank him for his help at Marathon, while the worship of Actaeon was begun to placate or appease the angry ghost. Pausanias said that Pyrrhos, the son of Achilles, after his help in scaring off the Gauls who tried to sack Delphi, received sacrifices, although previously the Delphians had held his tomb in discontent as he was seen as part of the enemy. In this case, the tomb was already present in the sanctuary, but not worshipped and seen or seen as any kind of religious or ritual resource. The variations in how heroes would appear could also be accessed through the iconographical material. Asclepius would show himself during any successful incubation, curing the sick and giving good advice. Many instances are known from the Epidaura and Yamata. But Epiphanes of Asclepius and other healing heroes could also take on different forms, anthropomorphic as well as zoomorphic. And here you see a well-known relief from the Amphiaraeon at Arakos, the healing shrine as well, where the hero Amphiaraos manifests himself both in anthropomorphic form as a doctor to the left and as a snake to the right, licking or biting the patient's shoulder. You can see here the human form and here the snake form. Likewise, Epiphanes of the Dioscuri are known to be represented in a variety of ways. The relief uh, to the left, which in, in, in the Louvre, shows them as riders in the sky, taking on human shape. But also the double cline below can see, be seen as an indication of their presence, or at least their imminent arrival. The vase to the right, uh, now in Plovdiv, shows in the upper register a double cline with two pillows and two lyres, next to a table with two drinking cups everything is set for the Dioscuri to arrive. Another relief, also in the Louvre, dated to around 400 BC, apparently showed Theseus making an epiphany in front of a man and his young son. This is a unique depiction of, of, of the hero, and it's unique in many sense. And I've discussed its iconography and meaning in detail in a paper some years ago. And I just want to say that I was recently contacted by a German colleague who works on reliefs and sculptures who suspected that this is a fake. It's a 19th century fake uh, made in Athens. I don't know. Uh, it was also incidentally first reported as seen in the house of the Swedish consul in Athens. Not that there is a connection, but it's a very intriguing piece. Finally, traces of heroic manifestations were noted, such as gigantic footprints of Heracles' feet, or the marks of the hoofs of the horses on which the, the Oscuri would ride. And this, the horse, traces of the horses as a, as a sign of the Dioscuri having visited was even used on some occasion to make others believe that the, the, these heroes, the twin heroes, had been present. And there are also heroic objects kept at various locations, clothes and jewelry, and even the leg, egg of Leda, uh, from which Clytemnestra, Helen, and the Oscuri emerge. Some of these objects were also worshipped, such as the cuirass of Ayas on Egina and the spear of Agamemnon, 
which received a Theoxenia ceremony. <clears throat> so, heroes could manifest themselves in anthropomorphic shape as phasmata, as animals, but also as objects indicating their presence. But what about the bones? How do they fit into hero cults? Bones is a characteristic feature of hero cult, contrary to that of the cult of the gods. But it's important to notice that bones were never a prerequisite for a hero cult, nor was the tomb of the hero. Even if the bones, <clears throat> um, even if the bones are a concrete expression of the hero and his power, many hero cults show no particular connections to any bones. So how many cases of heroic bones are known? This is a tricky question, which will receive different answers depending on the ancient evidence considered. If we look at the literary sources, there are surprisingly few cases to be found. Around 20 instances are recorded concerning bones of mythic as well as historical persons, most cases regarding bones being moved or discovered. The power and importance of these bones are evident from the stories of somebody explicitly searching for them in order to use them for political purposes or propaganda, or at least this is what some modern interpretations have suggested. The most famous account is that of Cimon finding the bones of Theseus on Skyros, as told by Plutarch. The Athenians were encouraged by Oracle of Delphi to recover these bones and give them an honorable burial at Athens and subsequently guard them. After Cimon had conquered the island, he managed to find the bones by the help of an eagle, which was pecking and clawing on what looked like a mound. Inside this mound, when he dug, he found a theke, and in it was a man of extraordinary size, a bronze spear and a bronze sword. Cimon brought back the bones to Athens, installed them in a shrine in the center of the city. The bones of Orestes, another really famous case, was recovered by the Spartans as a remedy for military loss against the Tegeans. Also here, the consultation of Delphi led to the suggestion to obtain the heroic bones, but the problem was that the location of the burial of this hero was only revealed or hinted at in a complicated riddle. Eventually, one of the Spartans figured out the location. <clears throat> um, they had accidentally been found by a Tegean blacksmith digging a well in his backyard. The Spartan convinced the Tegean blacksmith to rent him this particular space. It took some convincing, apparently. Uh, and once he got access to the property, he secretly dug up the bones again and hurried back to Sparta. Here the bones were buried in the Agora and worshipped. Also the bones of historical periods, period persons could be discovered and transferred, and once installed in the new location, become focus of religious attention. The bones of Leonidas were brought back to Sparta 40 years after Thermopylae and the yearly festival established, while its Sikion both Ephron's and Aratos' bones were relocalized and worshipped. A particularly interesting case of return uh, of bones is the bones of Philopoimen to the city of Megalopolis. It's mentioned by several ancient authors, but documented most explicitly in an inscription dated into 183 BC. According to the inscription, uh, Philopoimen was to receive godlike, interesting, isotioi, honors, a memorial, a mnema, established in the Agora, in which the bones were deposited. A white marble altar was raised, a white ox sacrificed, and there were also statues raised of Philopoimen in the city. The archaeological record could provide many more instances of heroic bones if we are to take the veneration of Mycenaean tombs in geometric archaic times as expressions of hero cult, which I think we should. But there are no evident instances of such cult activity of earlier tomes where the human bones seems to have been manipulated or handled to suggest that they had a special importance, recalling the moving and installation of bones known from the written sources. On the other hand, heroic bones seem to have featured entirely skeletons, judging from the literary sources, and not individual bones. So the mere presence of these bones in the Mycenaean tombs could have been taken as an expression of the hero's manifestations on these particular locations. Occasional human bones found in Greek sanctuaries could perhaps also represent bones of heroes buried in the precinct of the gods. 
In the sacred spring Temenos at Corinth, next to the mud altar, a human vertebra and three human teeth were recovered, and human remains have also been found at the Artemision at the Ephesus and the geometric levels at Comos on Crete. But these sporadic finds could also be a disturbed aerial burial, not related to the later sanctuary activity or simply intrusive finds. Mm -hmm. In 2016, a spectacular discovery was made in the ash altar of Zeus at Mount Lycaon in Arcadia. Here, a young male individual had been buried lying on his back in a simple tomb bordered by stones, you see to the left. The burial dates to 11th century BC and is highly interesting since it was made in the actual altar, which at when the burial was made had been used for several hundred years. This skeleton has been connected to the ancient traditions of human sacrifice in the cult of Zeus Lucaius and the consumption of human flesh. As this is clearly a burial without any indication of any ritual um, handling of the body for sacrificial purposes, its presence should perhaps rather be connected with a hero cult. Perhaps we here see the creation of a hero cult by the installation of the hero in the sanctuary, just as other heroes could be buried in sanctuaries of gods. But of course, the location in the ash altar is puzzling to say the least. The focus on the bones and hero cults raised many questions. Why were they so important? A hero was someone who had died and a dead body will produce bones. The contrast between rotting flesh of a corpse and bare bones once the process is over is found in many cultures and in many cases elaborated on for various purposes. Especially the soft rotting body tissue is seen as problematic and polluting while the clean bones are pure and possess the power. The inhumation of a corpse eventually results in bare bones, but the fact is that a skillful cremation of a body will also leave the bones white and bare, though in a more fragmented state. Jean-Pierre Renan made the analogy between bare bones of sacrificial animals burnt in the fire and the cremation of the dead warriors in the Homeric epics. Fire burns away the flesh that they decompose exposing the white bones in the ash to picked, be picked up and buried. Bones would thus constitute a marker of indestructibility and therefore are the immortal parts of a human being. And the same would then apply to heroes. But other factors may also have contributed to the importance of bones. And here the complex issue of the rise of hero cults as a phenomenon is, of, as a phenomenon is relevant. One reason um, proposed for the origin of hero cults has been the discovery of Mycenaean tombs in the geometric period in combination with the spread of the Homeric epics, which led people to identify the individuals buried in these tombs with the Greek heroes or myth. The early Iron Age visitors of the late age, Bronze Age chamber tombs and Tholoi would discover intact skeletons and completely preserved bones since the Mycenaean dead were inhumed. These finds would directly recall the ostia levka, the white bones essential for burials in Homeric, of the Homeric heroes, contrary to the cremation burials dominating the Iron Age, uh, early Iron Age and the historical period. Hero cults were definitely part of the early Iron Age ritual landscape, but the practice of collecting and venerating human remains in a manner that we would characterize as hero cults uh, may in fact have been in existence already in the Mycenaean period. At Lerna in the Argolid, the archaeological context of two shaft graves from the late Helladic I period, that is the 15th century BC, suggests that they were opened 200 years later with the explicit purpose of finding the remains of the individuals buried here. The graves were dug up, the bones were removed, apart from two fragments that were overlooked, these two, here you see the actual burials. Uh, a set of drinking vessels were deposited in the graves, the open graves, perhaps as a sign of respect for the dead, and the shafts were then immediately backfilled, and this we can see from the archaeological context. To where these removed bones were transferred, we cannot know, but one possibility is Mycenae, the main center of the region during this period. The importance of safekeeping burials of certain prominent individuals at Mycenae during precisely this period 
is also evident from the incorporation mm -hmm. of the so-called gray, gray circle A within the huge city wall when it was extended. <clears throat> Um, perhaps with a, with a purpose to protect these burials and any bones from being stolen. And Mycenae may also wanted to boost their own power by incorporating powerful dead persons from Lerna. If the situation at Lerna can be taken as emptying of graves with the explicit purpose to access human bones, this would recall later instances of the retrieval of hero bones, for example, those of Theseus. This aspect of hero cult would then be part of the religious practices inherited from the late Bronze Age, together with, for example, the names of several of the gods, rather than an innovation of the early Iron Age. An additional reason behind the traditions about heroic bones could have been the recovery of fossils. Adrienne Mayer, in her interesting study, The First Fossil Hunters, makes a strong case for the bones of prehistoric animals being related to ancient stories of finding the bones of heroes and giants. She has shown that in several of the regions where ancient sources speak of these huge bones being found are also um, regions where fossils have been recovered in modern times. And here you see her suggestive image of how the skeleton of a prehistoric animal could be arranged to look like a giant. You have top left and then to the right. That the ancient Greeks were aware of such fossils, um, fossils bones and even made use of them for reconstructing the past is suggested by this Corinthian 6th century vase, showing Heracles fighting the so-called monster of Troy. Here and here. The beast was a sea monster, or a ketos, sent by Poseidon to punish King Laomedon, who tried to sneak out of paying for the walls the god had uh, constructed for Troy. An oracle declared that the only way to get rid of the monster was for the king to sacrifice his daughter. The princess was chained to a rock near the sea, but fortunately Heracles arrived when the Ketos came to eat her and killed it. On the vase, we see Heracles attacking the Ketos, whose appearance is unique. Um, instead, its head, looking like a bear skull, actually shows striking similarities to a giraffe-like an animal, the Samotherium, that lived on Sassos more than three million years ago. Comparing the monster of Troy with the fossilized head of a cemeterium makes these similarities obvious. The artist added a tongue and sharp teeth, and there are no horns. But considering the rarity of the representation the icono in the iconography of Greek monsters, it's possible that the artist has depicted a fossilized skull. Fossils were and have been found on both Samos and in Western Turkey and may have inspired both the story and the representation. In one version of this myth, it's said that the monster emerged after an earthquake. If the fossilized bones were preserved in the earth banks along the coast, they could have been exposed through earthquakes or the waves created by storms. <clears throat> um, and, this is, and in effect, erosion by the sea waves was not an unknown reason for exposure of heroic bones in antiquity. In Florostatos Heroikos, there are several accounts of how the sea or an earthquake exposes huge bones of giants or heroes in the past. And in one case, it's the actual burial mound of Ayas that is ripped apart by the waves, leaving the bones bare, including his um, kneecap, which is the size of a boy's bronze discus lying exposed until they are reburied by the Emperor Hadrian. Keeping fossils in mind, we should take a look at the most famous heroic bone of antiquity, the shoulder blade of Pelops. As a child, Pelops was dismembered and boiled by his father Tantalos and served as a stew to the gods. All the gods recoiled from the table except Demeter, who was confused and sad looking for her daughter and thereby happened to eat a part of Pelops' shoulder. Zeus killed Tantalos for serving the gods human meat. Pelops was back, put back in the cauldron again and reboiled, and eventually emerged alive and well, but now equipped with an ivory shoulder instead of the pot eaten by Demeter. After his death, this wonderful shoulder blade was first kept in Pisa, in Pisa according to Pesenias, and later loaned to the Greeks at Troy, a precondition for them to win the war. On its way back to Troy, it was lost at sea, and considered lost forever until a fisherman, Damar Menos, caught it in his net. 
amazed by his size, an inquiry to Delphi led to the bone being returned to Elis and displayed at Olympia and Damarmenos and his descendants becoming its guardians. When Pausanias visited Olympia, the shoulder blade had gone missing again, though the rest of the, bodies, the bones of the hero were kept in a small sanctuary outside Olympia. Pelops' shoulder blade occupied a unique position among known hero bones. Its size was apparently impressive, and it possessed particular powers of an individual bone, contrary to the other cases where we only meet bones, probably more or less intact skeletons and not body parts. The shoulder blade of Pelops may also have been a fossil. Adrian Mayer suggests that a mammoth scapula may have been what was recovered by the fisherman, or such a bone may have been found near Olympia, and finds of mammoth bones are known from this region of Greece. And we also know that fossils were dedicated in other sanctuaries, for example, the Samian Herion. The size of the mammoth's shoulder blade would leave no one in doubt that this comes from an extraordinary being, whatever it would be. And the drawing to the right shows in the red circle the, a human sh shoulder blade in com size comparison to the mammoth shoulder blade. A further aspect which may have led the fossil to be identified as the ivory shoulder is the fact that very old bones often resemble ivory in texture and color, especially when they have been polished. As the bone was recovered at sea, another possibility would be that a whale shoulder blade was identified as that of Pelops. Such bones can take on ex impressive sizes and actually crop up in the archaeological record. Here you see one case of a thin whale shoulder blade found in the 9th century context in the Athenian Agora. It's probably been used as a work surface, but what it was, how it was used before, if at all, we cannot tell. But at least it's a whale shoulder blade. <clears throat> um, and these could also, a find of such a bone could also be taken a confirmation of the super size of heroes of the past. It's also of interest to consider the power of these bones. They did have power. This is obvious from the stories of heroic bones being sought after and even stolen. The traffic of bones and therefore power of the heroes was an established feature of Greek hero cults. The story of Cimon locating the bones of Theseus on Skyros and the marvelous discovery of Orestes' bone in the backyard of the blacksmiths are telling examples. But not all bones possessed powers. There are many accounts of finding huge bones described as those of giants or heroes, but with no indication of a cult being instituted. They could be marveled at, but they triggered no cultic actions. For the bones to result in a hero cult, particular conditions were needed, and most of all, a sanction by Delphi, which provided the bones with the power needed. But what power did these bones contain, apart from being some kind of epicenter of a cult? Their importance seems to lie, most of all, when a cult is instituted or established, while there are less interest once the cult was up and running. The instances that call for some kind of action from bones are few. The one and obvious case is the shoulder blade of Pelops, just discussed, which had to be present in Troy for the Greeks to win the war. But there are no indication of, in our sources that this bone or any other heroic bones was shown to visitors in sanctuaries or used in any other sense the rest of the body of Pelops attracting surprisingly little interest. And when Pausanias even notes that the bones were kept in another sanctuary, and he even didn't bother to go and see them, it appears. It's worth remembering again that the possession of the hero's bones was not a prerequisite uh, for the worship of the same hero. Neither was the location of the hero's tomb. Institutions of cult could be triggered by the find finding or relocation of a hero's bones, but even the tomb may be present without being the object of worship. All heroes did not even have tombs, uh, like Amphiaraos, who simply disappeared at battle at Thebes, or the tomb was the secret and hidden from worship, like that of Oedipus at Athens. And hero cults could also be instituted by other reasons, such as the apparition of a hero, or as a remedy to a problem or a crisis, often stemming from wrongful death, again at the advice of Delphi. On the whole, it's possible that the importance of bones in Greek hero cults have been exaggerated by scholars. Considering the many hero cults known, comparatively few involve bones. 
Possibly the focus on bones could be the result of a desire to compare or link hero cults with the cults of saints. Heroes as a religious category is difficult to grasp, dead but still divine, and the comparison with saints could be an attempt to better understand their character and role within a larger context. But most of all, bones occupied a very prom most of all, bones occupy a very prominent position in the cult of saints. The power of heroic bones have, of, have thus often been compared with Christian relics, and we have the, the, the first big study of this by Pfister. It's called the Reliquium Cult in Altertum and treats both heroic and, and saints' bones. There are, of course, similarities, but the differences are more important. Heroic bones, apart from the shoulder blade of Pelops again, seems to have been skeletons, or more or less intact bones, intact bodies. Uh, they are bones as a group, not singular items, which is often the case with Christian relics. The power of heroic bones lies in possessing them, not displaying them, and the bones themselves do not have the ability to transmit any force simply through contact, which is a constant phenomenon of Christian relics. And this leads us to the final point to consider, the relation between the hero as a body and the hero as bones. A god could manifest himself or herself in many ways, in human disguise, in a statue, as an animal, a phasma, even amorphously, but this was always the same entity in various shapes. Heroes are different. They can also appear as phasmata, as animals, or even sounds, but contrary to gods, they have these two lives, or two phases of lives, one before and one after death. And after death, the hero takes on two different shapes. On the one hand, as an apparition, interacting or interfering with the lives of men, as gods can, and on the other, as the actual bones, which also possess some of the power. What I find most interesting in this perspective is to what extent a hero may be present both as a physical figure of anthropomorphic shape or as an apparition or a phasma, or and his bones. The somewhat bizarre question would then be that what is the relation between the hero as an active figure and his bones? Could a hero move around while his bones were lying in the tomb? Would he be able to live without his skeleton? I'm aware that this is probably a question that would, become, would, would um, come across as entirely absurd for an ancient Greek, but it's still of interest to ponder if we are to grasp the complexity of work, the workings of hero cult. We can start by noting that there are very few cases for which we have evidence for a hero whose bones were recognized and kept somewhere and who also made an intervention in some form. The only case seems to be the one of Theseus, whose bones were kept in Athens, but who was also said to have appeared and participated in the Battle of Marathon. However, this was before the bones were located on Syros and transferred to Athens, and his active participation in this battle is only reported by Plutarch, so we have a chronological issue here that has to be dealt with. Perhaps we are to see no contradiction in the hero having the possibility of appearing at two locations at the same time, or in two versions, as a phasma, and as, as I said previous um, version, as a phasma, apparition, or apparition, and his bones. The bones themselves do not seem to have had the agency of the phasma, and as said earlier, the important thing was to possess the bones, not to show them off or handle them in some way. Likewise, ownership of the tomb also meant possession of the hero, rather, whether or not the bones were visible. Just as gods could act, act through their statues, heroes could act through their bones, but they would more frequently interfere or make an appearance without any connection or relation to the bones. Pelops' presence at Troy rather marks the inverse situation. His shoulder blade was apparently required for the Greek victory, but there is no mention of an apparition or phasma of the actual hero among the Greeks. Perhaps this would not have worked out, since Pelops' grandchildren, Agamemnon and Menelaus, were leading the army. The sudden appearance of their dead grandfather would probably have created more confusion than added clout to the Greek army. For an apparition for a hero to fully function, there had to be a sufficient distance in time, we may assume. When it comes to the active power of the hero, 
the bones seem to have been of less interest and have had less agency than the apparition of the hero himself. Possessing the bones provides access to the hero, but does not ascertain that he will appear when needed. So, where have all of this left us? Are we any wiser as to what constitutes a hero and how we are to understand the relation between the body and the bones? If you feel that you're not, do not despair. As comfort, I will end with a few li lines from Lucian, who provides us with an insight into the ancient understanding of heroes, or rather difficulties in understanding. In the Dialogues of the Dead, Menippos visits the underworld and here meets Trophonios and Amphilochos. He takes the opportunity to have a conversation on the topic of gods and heroes, a topic that clearly puzzles him. Finally, he turns to Trophonius and asks, but in the name of prophecy, what is a hero? I don't know, Trophonius answers, a compound between a god and a man. Unfortunately, this pretty much leads us back where all of this started. Thank you.